Um, all right. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to um, my talk on breaking the 1.5 MB barrier, uh, running large AI ML Metaflow flows on Argo. Um, I am Saurabh. Uh, I work at Outerbounds. And today, we are going to dive into how, uh, what, what are some of the challenges that you might face when you are running large workflows uh, on Argo and how we sort of overcame some of those challenges. Um, the customary agenda slide, um, we'll talk a little about the Metaflow and the Outerbounds platform and how the these large uh, AI ML data science workloads on Argo workflows can um, sort of uh, cause consternation, um, and what are, what are some of the steps that you can take in order to run them smoothly and successfully. But, you know, with every good story, there is a background story to it. There's an origin story to it. And that, if we understand what that origin story is, then the, the actual story makes a lot more sense. So let's sort of try to figure out what, what that origin story is. Metaflow is sort of a human-friendly Python library um, that is that was built to uh, help AI ML data scientists uh, to develop, deploy, and operate their applications smoothly and easily. However, um, as as you sort of see on the on the slide, the folks who work on AI ML, who, who are AI or ML practitioners, versus folks who run the infrastructure for them, have very different viewpoints when it comes to uh, running and operating uh, these uh, particular applications. On the, on the left-hand side, you will notice there is a, a really nice purple hat person, uh, which is sort of in, our, in the Metaflow, uh, Metaflow verse, um, uh, a data scientist or a, or a uh, AI ML persona. And they sort of care about things like modeling, deployment, versioning a lot more compared to you know, data, compute, or orchestration. Now, what are what are what are some of what are some of these uh, uh, bullet points really saying? When when you think about modeling, modeling essentially refers to the fact that um, you want to be able to pull out any library that you find on on the web. It might be Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, or whatever. You bring your favorite library and use it in order to create uh, your your flows. Uh, that might allow you to create, uh, bring value out of your AI or ML applications. De deployment, on the other hand, basically says once you have uh, your applications uh, running, you you sort of go through the iterative process of building them on your local machine. But then, any viable production application has to be uh, deployed in a reliable and has to be executed in a reproducible fashion on production. Versioning, on the other hand, says I am. Uh, you are always uh, interacting with other software engineers or data scientists, infra infrastructure people, and while you are going through the the, de the development and the deployment process, you want to be able to version not only your code but also the artifacts that might have been generated via via the execution of those uh, of those um, applications. You want to be able to say, "Hey, I uh, I had I had executed application, let's say release v 1.0, and now I'm running application release v 3.0, and I want to figure out how the artifacts that I had uh, uh, that I had created on v 1.0 or 2.0, what are the values of those artifacts? You'd want to be able to uh, easily go ahead and um, figure out any diffs or just see if there's something going on." Um, that might that might tell you if your application is misbehaving, for instance. Orchestration. Now let's sort of step into the world of the other side of the equation, which is a yellow hat, uh, an, an individual or a persona that cares a little more about infrastructure rather than uh, rather than anything else. From the orchestration perspective, uh, any AI or ML uh, platform or any AI ML um, uh, library out there needs to make sure that um, when you write up your uh, your flows or your code, you are able to test them locally. Because testing on production will not only lead to maybe cost overruns, but might just be, might just be difficult. 
So you need to have a, an orchestration layer that can interpret what your code looks like and run it uh, locally on your local machine and um, allow you to it, uh, iterate quickly on the, on the code that you have. Compute, the core layer that sort of you can't do anything without, whether it's data science or AI or ML. Now, any, any uh, platform out there that uh, integrates with uh, your Elastic Cloud providers, the, the, the AWS is GCP uh, Azure's of the world, allows you to say, hey, I have this particular uh, code that is uh, executing amazingly well on my local machine, but hey, I now, now need 250 gigs of RAM because I need to train my model on, on really large data. How do I move my local project over to the Elastic Cloud seamlessly? And finally, data. Nothing, nothing moves in this world without data. You cannot, whether it is synthetic data, whether it is a publicly available data set, you cannot, uh, you cannot pretty much build any application without data. Um, also, these data, uh, the, the, the data cohorts might be available, uh, let's say, whether in a Snowflake uh, environment or it might be available in S3 or some Oracle database, pick your, pick your, uh, take your pick. Uh, they might be tabular data, non-tabular data, uh, take your pick. So Metaflow sort of took these uh, six, uh, six pieces as the, the building blocks of its, uh, of its library, and um, it said any particular AI ML uh, application will be well served if uh, the platform uh, supported these particular tenets. For example, we sub Metaflow supports production-grade deployments via Argo. It tracks all your flows, experiments, uh, and artifacts automatically without you having to say, hey, uh, this particular artifact that I'm creating needs to be versioned uh, in, in a database or in S3 or whatever. It's all taken care of for you under the covers. You can, um, uh, with, with Argo, we sort of know you can create uh, workflows uh, that can be quite complicated to create if you were to do, if you were to do that by, uh, by hand, but Metaflow allows you to uh, write those same workflows very easily uh, in Python and write them via a, a directed acyclic graph and then transform them via a single command into an Argo workflow that you can then execute either locally or if you want, you can execute, uh, execute it on the cloud. And last but not the least, access your data from anywhere. Bring it from your Snowflake instance, bring it from your uh, Oracle instance or your Lakehouse instance. It's all uh, seamless to Metaflow. The Out of Bounds platform is sort of uh, the platform behind Metaflow, which allows you to, uh, which is sort of also built on the same principles that I just outlined. Uh, more interestingly, uh, when it comes to the deployments aspect of the platform, there is, uh, there is a deep integration with Argo workflows, where uh, you can, uh, the, the, same, uh, the same DAGs that you had written locally can uh, move to Argo workflows via a single command, and you can see your uh, complicated DAGs running uh, in Argo um, via, via just a single command that you can execute. Um, Metaflow uh, has been is widely adopted uh, uh, across the ecosystem. Uh, as you can see, there are a bunch of folks who are um, both um, uh, who, who are adoptees of this particular platform and are, are using them to crunch through massive amounts of data for uh, their data science projects as well as uh, creating value via AI and ML applications. Now. With, with that uh, background, with, with the background story um, on, on the origins of Metaflow, um, the, one, of the, one, of the biggest, um, one of the biggest advantages that uh, Metaflow sort of provides is the fact that you can run your AI, ML, or DS workloads in parallel across many, 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 many computers. There is a construct in Metaflow called the for each construct, uh, which allows you to say, hey, uh, let's say you have a company that is, um, that is doing business in multiple countries, and uh, for each country, you want to have a different data set that you want to use for, let's say, your hyperparameter, uh, 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 for hyperparameter, um, um, 
then essentially what you can do is you can use uh, the params um, uh, argument and you can create different uh, arguments that can then be executed on each uh, on a different um, uh, on a different computer uh, which will be running your train step so in this example there is a dag a very straightforward dag to be honest where, where you have a start step then uh, there is a train step, and the start step essentially uh, kicks off a bunch of train uh, train steps. Each train step runs on a different computer, and finally they join together because hey, you're running a DAG. Um, you've sort of heard me say a lot about you can use a single command uh, in order to uh, move your code uh, from your local machine over to Argo. Now, what is that single command? So all you need to say is Python flow.py Argo workflows create. And your Metaflow flow that was currently just a Python file on your local machine suddenly transforms into this magical YAML that is now uh, a part of Argo, which can now do uh, reliable uh, orchestration for your flow uh, in a reliable, in a scheduled, in a uh, repeatable manner uh, on Kubernetes. Um, our, our choice of platform uh, has been Kubernetes, uh, and Argo will sort of kick off um, you know, n number of pods uh, that are running on your Kubernetes cluster. But coming coming to the, with, with all of this background uh, story, the problem with these workloads is when you, when you think about DAGs that can become, let's say, 5,000 nodes wide, or they can become 1,000 nodes deep, running these large Argo workloads is hard on Kubernetes. Why? Metaflow DAGs, as I said, they can be arbitrary in size, and but etcd sort of limits the max re max request size to 1.5 MIB. Um, so let's say if you wanted to run a DAG which was say 6,000 nodes wide, the the Argo work uh, the Argo workflow object will essentially uh, fail to update uh, via the Argo controller. You will run into problems like high throughput, like. You, you want to minimize your end-to-end -end latency for your workloads uh, because in, in any Kubernetes environment, it does not operate in a vacuum. There are, uh, there are uh, things like queues or web, webhook executions that uh, every uh, workload has, uh, every object in the workload has to go through. So you want to make sure that you have high throughput by minimizing the end-to-end -end latencies experienced by uh, any workload. You want to make sure that these large workloads are not cannibalizing all of the resources that you have in your Kubernetes cluster. You want to, uh, you want to promote equitable resource sharing so that team A doesn't come back to the yellow hat and says, hey, I had, a, a five node, uh, I had a five GPU node and now I don't have any uh, GPUs available to me because there is this large workload that is running on the, uh, by, via team B and uh, my, my jobs are stuck. Error handling. Uh, workloads can fail randomly. Um, you, you can have network failures, I/O failures, user uh, errors, infra failures. So, if you were um, unable to detect or visualize these failures quickly enough, it can lead to a lot of wasted compute. Things like distributed training, gang scheduling, uh, which can uh, uh, which can have a uh, lot of nested for eaches with uh, that need to be executed in parallel, uh, is all or nothing. And if you have a really, really large gang scheduled uh, workflow that you want to schedule on your cluster, it might not schedule for a long time, depending on how uh, on the resources that are available. So let's sort of talk about one of those uh, issues, which is the uh, which is what happens when you have really large workloads that are unable to fit on etcd. The as I as I mentioned, the Argo workflow status. Uh, stores the status of every node in the DAG. And if you utilize the for each constru construct, it's very easy to sort of uh, have a lot of these uh, statuses updated on etcd, at which point the you will sort of uh, run into an error uh, that Argo will throw, which is request entity too large and unable to update the object. Um, remember, this error is not going to happen immediately. It's uh, it's a uh, uh, it's a runtime error, which means you've sort of gone through a whole bunch of computation before suddenly you say, oops, uh, I've wasted, uh, let's say, uh, you know, six hours in compute and now my, my workload has failed. Now, you know, how do you, how do you break that barrier? Um, Argo sort of supports this uh, feature called offloading, 
where you don't, where the node statuses do not necessarily need to be stored on etcd, but they can be offloaded over to uh, persistence to a different persistence layer. I believe it's both MySQL and Postgres at the moment. But essentially, the way you uh, wire it up is when you start up your workflow controller, uh, or your, the Argo workflows controller, you can pass through the persistence object, which where you can say, hey, the node, the node status offload can be set to true, and you can give details about the, 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 the database that you want to um, offload your status to. In this case, we've chosen Postgres uh, for, for our particular use case. Now, offloading your Argo workflows is one, one piece of the puzzle. However, there are, uh, you've been, you sort of been hearing, uh, you sort of been uh, hearing me say that these large work, workflows can run for hours on end, right? And one, when you have these large workflows, you do want to bring your compute capacity not only from a single region, but you want to, let's say, spread it out across multiple regions, or you want to spread it out across multiple clouds, then if you have your Argo controller sort of running in a single location, that sort of uh, does two things. First, it makes your architecture a little more tightly coupled with the, with the workload that you're running. And secondly, there is, uh, there is running cost that, the, that customers have to uh, exp have to sort of eat in order to um, simply because they're running an Argo workflows controller. So what we've done uh, is we've moved out the Argo workflows uh, uh, machinery over to our control plane, and it can now connect over to multiple regions or multiple clouds even, so that um, you know a customer might say, "Hey, I want to run all my non." Um, uh, my, my non-important uh, workloads in US West 2, but all my uh, important workloads need to run in US East 1, or they need to run in GCP because, hey, I have GCP credits, or they need to run in um, Azure because of whatever reason. So th the flexibility that, uh, that opens up becomes, uh, becomes, quite, uh, becomes quite nice. So uh, once we have done the the offloading, as you can see, what we were able to achieve was uh, earlier, um, the, by, by default, I believe the Argo workloads can scale up to about 3,000 odd um, nodes without breaking out, but uh, our customers need ma uh, magnitudes larger uh, size of the Argo workloads, at, uh, which is about 10,000. So because of uh, offloading, we were able to uh, scale the Argo workflows execution over to about 10,000 um, wide um, uh, Argo workflow uh, in, our, in, our, in our setup. Um, talking about a little bit of future work, uh, right now what you'll notice is um, Argo uh, workflows, when, when you're offloading, it only sort of um, allows for um, username password based authentications. We want to be a little more conscious about security, so we want to move, uh, start supporting IAM based authentications uh, for the Out of Bounds platform, for security conscious customers, uh, as well as uh, you, you heard me say a little while earlier about how do you make sure you have a little more equitable uh, resource sharing policies that customers can uh, can uh, configure for their um, uh, for their workloads uh, so to say like um, let's say if you, we can talk about fair share scheduling or you can talk about uh, any other scheduling um, uh, paradigm that you could come up with and and like a whole bunch of other things um, if if there is uh, if you have more questions please come find us uh, at the R41 booth uh, or any of our social events that that are um, that are happening today and tomorrow, would love to would love to sort of uh, step aside and chat with uh, with everyone. Um, that's that's it uh, from me. Um, thank you so much. Um, happy to take questions. How do you decide between creating more clusters or adding more nodes to clusters when you're looking at these really large uh, workloads? And what uh, flavor of cluster do you use? Um, good question. So um, on, on our end, um, it is a function of um, how much um, 
how much um, what, what is the what is the uh, proper what are the properties of the workloads that the customer wants to run a uh, customer might say um, i want uh, i have like really large workloads that run only in um, um, like only in spikes, they they don't really run. Uh, you know, every every other day they run maybe let's say once a quarter, or they run you know every two weeks or so. For those for those types of workloads, uh, you know, we can uh, we are happy to sort of just create another node group where folks can you know they are just targeted for those really large workloads. For other workloads where that might not be as large, it does not really. In, our, in, in the cases that I've seen, it does not really merit an entire new Kubernetes cluster that we are managing for them. So it really depends on the properties of the, the workloads that, they, that the customers need to run. Um, thank you, thank you everyone. All right.